sense of how you think the fintech sector is going to evolve? And is it going to involve more collaboration or is it going to involve more disruption? And I'm going to start with you, Sheila. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely going to uh, evolve with more collaboration. Um, you know, you, you need a stable, uh, well-regulated uh, banking system uh, that has some safety net support to get the economy through cycles. Uh, and so I, I, don't, I, don't, I think you'll always need that, and I don't see a sense of, of disrupting that. But I do see partnerships and collaborations that will provide a lot of value added, both to banks as well as to the, uh, the public that they serve. I think you're already seeing it now and getting, especially in, in the small dollar lending space, getting origination costs down, expanding access to uh, credit. And so um, I, I do think uh, there are tremendous opportunities to build efficiencies into banking, to lower the cost for uh, consumers and businesses. And I absolutely think that's going to occur through partnerships, not through disruption. Partnerships. What about you, Jeff? I mean, you, the world of investment advice changing very dramatically. Uh, how do you see the collaborate or not? Well, I think you've got, you've got us and you've got uh, you know, the, the startups. And the fact is probably 75% of our technology that we build is coming from the fintech sector. Um, you know, we don't really want to be innovators because that's not what we're really good at. We, we want to leverage the best ideas that sit outside that. And, you know, we're coming at it from, you know, we have $2 trillion in assets, 2.2 million customers uh, with 16,000 advisors. And that's our strength and our intellectual capital. But we're not known for being nimble and, and quick. On the other side, you've got guys like John that are nimble and quick, right? And what's happening, I think, is there's a, there's a confluence that's taking place between these two, these two models. And um, you know, we'll see how it ultimately plays out, but it's, uh, it certainly is an interesting time. But John, you're one of the nimble upstarts. Uh, do you want to you know, collaborate with, with people like Jeff, or do you want to disrupt them? So Betterment started because I'd been in the financial services industry for years uh, as a consultant to some of the country's largest banks. And lots of smart, well-meaning people, but they were just so slow to move and so slow to innovate and not thinking about the customers. And I wanted to build a company. I wanted to build products that would really change financial services, that would start with what customers want uh, and build, build from there. And I saw that wasn't going to happen in the, in the traditional banks. There was just too little incentive to innovate, too many conflicts. And so uh, that's, that's why I started Betterment. And, uh, and I think there will be collaboration between these firms. Obviously, so many uh, incumbents are now coming into our space, acquiring smaller firms, uh, copying our business model to some extent. And, uh, and we're going to continue to see that. But there's an opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity for some firms, some really innovative firms, to break through and become the respected, trusted consumer brands for the next generation of financial services. Let's, let's stick with you, for, because Betterment was what? It was the first robo advisor 2010. And now, as you say, the others, the, the big guys, um, are coming into this space the Schwabs, the Vanguards, the Fidelities. How is that changing the way you think about your business? Are they, are they simply doing what you were doing later? Or are you, how are you going to kind of differentiate yourself that you do become the, the, the disruptor that is the big, uh, the big one that survives? Right. All of these firms coming into the space is, in one sense, uh, incredible validation for what we do. We often get the question, does that mean that uh, you know, they're going to just take the market and there won't be anything left for you? No, this is an enormous market. Uh, in fact, as these firms have entered the space, we've grown faster. When Schwab launched its robo-advisor, we started growing 15% faster the very next day because they started marketing and people saw their advertisements and decided to sign up for Betterment instead. Um, so all of this, so they, uh, they, they, they they're helping. They do it. They think that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's maybe counterintuitive, but the more people are educated about the options that are available and that maybe the thing they're doing today isn't what's best, the more they start to look around, the more they're open to the idea. Financial service is one of these things that takes decades to change. It requires partnership with regulators. It requires movement from the big firms. So as a startup, the best thing we can see is that the incumbents are having to adapt. Let's, let's talk about regulators, because finance is one of the industries where the nature of disruption is affected by regulation probably more than any other. Um, you know, it's such a heavily regulated industry. You know, if you, it, compared to other industries where it's really the pace of technological innovation that's driving the scale, pace of disruption, is, are these financial regulations, Sheila, and you know more about them than pretty much anybody in the room, are they a barrier to entry? 
for, for people like John? Are they something that traditional firms hide behind? How are they going to shape the fintech revolution? Yeah, so um, they may be a bit of a barrier to entry. Uh, I think you, you have two sets of, of, of rules, basically. You have a consumer rules, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that applies across the board to regulated banks and non-bank non, uh, uh, potential disruptors. And then you have uh, the regulated sector, <clears throat> where it's really, that puts limits on what a bank can do in terms of partnering with a, uh, <clears throat> with a potential uh, technology a disruptor and innovator. So I, I think, uh, is it optimal in terms of rapid paced innovation? No, but is it, is it, is, are the benefits away the cost? I think they do. I think it's important, again, you know, banks have the safety net, they have trillions of insured deposits, they have access to Federal Reserve uh, lending facilities, there's a lot of backstop support, and you want them some built in conservatism, conservatism into their activities. We saw what happened when you kind of take those, uh, those regulatory structures off in 2008. But allowing the non-bank sector uh, to innovate and experiment a bit before you have significant partnerships with banks, so you, you test the model a bit more, I think, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. So, uh, and I would also say regulation in one sense probably um, uh, helps uh, the banks in the sense that uh, we, you know, when we, we peel Glass-Steagall, we removed the barriers between securities insurance and banking, but we didn't in commercial ownership of financial services. So a Google or an Apple or an Amazon or whatever can't come in and buy a big bank. That's just not going to happen. So that's definitely a barrier to entry, but maybe uh, one that uh, is good longer term for the stability of the system. Do you agree with that, Jeff? Do you see it as a, a barrier to entry, but one that is helpful? I think, I think you have to be very specific about what type of the fintech you're talking about. I think the, on the, the banking and lending side, I think there's clearly barriers because if you're a small player, you still need capital, and there's a whole set of issues around that. I think in the robust space, it's a little bit of a different problem. That being said, you know, where we are, you know, particularly the DOL, which is the most significant thing that's come down for our industry for, for many years, which is really driving the whole industry to a fiduciary standard, which we believe is absolutely the right thing. And How is that going to change the industry going forward? Well, it's, I'll tell you, if you're a... If, the, the whole self-directed brokerage model is, is going to go away. And, and it's going to move towards a place where um, advisors or firms are going to be held to a higher standard with respect to the types of investments that they give. It's going to require greater transparency. It's going to require, in some cases, more documentation and bureaucracy in some cases. Um, in some ways, we actually think we're, we actually are, are pretty good with it. Um, one, because it actually is in the best interest of the customer. But the other thing is that we've got a long history from an advisory perspective in terms of running that business. So it's not so daunting for us to have to sort of meet those types of... Uh, and what does it mean for the, for the startups, for the disruptors, John? What we see is, is that regulation and the industry move hand in hand. And the biggest periods of innovation in the industry also correlate closely with the biggest periods of regulatory innovation. So if you look back in the 1930s, we had the regulation of the securities markets after the 29 crash. All kinds of new firms started in that era. In the 70s, we had the introduction of the 401k, later the IRA, things like cash management accounts and, uh, and so on came out of that era, de deregulation of commissions. And today, this DOL rule and other moves that we expect to come around pushing towards a fiduciary advice model are a, a major impetus for more innovation. I think they, they go hand in hand. I don't think the DOL rule would have gone through or gone as far if it weren't for robo-advisors. They saw that, that model and said, great, we can, they saw what Betterment and, and our peers are doing, they said, great, we can, we can do this now because we can provide advice for everyone. We can make it more accessible. And that model of advice and management accessible to everybody is the future of financial services. We're moving from a more, you have to manage this all yourself and just figure it out and here's a bunch of options to, here is a thing that works for you and solves for your goals and, and your needs. And what are the, I mean, you said that you made a convince, very convincing argument that regulation is spurring innovation. What are the other ones apart from DOL that you see are kind of pushing, pushing innovation? We expect that the SEC, uh, which has been looking at this fiduciary standard for some time, will probably follow suit with the DOL and extend that fiduciary standard, not just to retirement accounts, which is what the DOL does, but to taxable accounts as well. So that will presumably fairly radically change the advisory business and wealth management business, Jeff. Yes, um, and I think the, the trick with firms like ours and, and our competitors is that you better be positioned today to be providing that level of, of, of service and advice 
because if you're not doing it today, trying to create a culture around that is going to be very, very difficult. And is that, does that demand a radical change to your business model? No, not at all. Because we've got you know, probably 20 years of, of, of doing that type of business. It's the largest portion of our business model today. It's our fastest growing portion of our business model. So you know, from our perspective, we're very comfortable with that. You know, what do you think, in, in addition perhaps to DOL, what are the regulatory changes that, from your perspective, you think will spur the most collaboration and innovation? Right. Well, I, I think it, it's hard to tell. I, you know, and I think you want to, regulators, uh, obviously, the litmus test is to do what's good public policy, not to, to advantage one business model over another, though I was a strong supporter of fiduciary standard, and I think uh, that is going to be uh, uh, promulgating some very, very positive changes overall in, the, in that business. Um, you know, I think uh, blockchain technology, perhaps, uh, the, uh, if they can get it right, uh, to make it uh, have a more reliable and alterable chain uh, of ownership, uh, better audits so that you can trace back the, the origin of a particular transaction. I think it has potential AML BSA uh, advantages as well as obviously lowering cost uh, significantly uh, through greater efficiencies in that model. So that's one area where I think regulators might want to cautiously nudge. Um, you know, the OCC is talking about doing a fintech charter. I think they're, they're trying to foster an environment. What, what um, would a fintech charter involve? A fintech, well, is, is the OCC is, uh, in, it, there, has, there have been uh, some, uh, there's some, some praise and some criticism for it. I think uh, part of it is to uh, create a special charter that would foster innovation, but also within a more consistent national uh, landscape, especially for uh, online lending platforms. We have, uh, fortunately, we do have a, a federal uh, consumer protection agency now to provide some uniform national standards, but there's still a lot of local laws, especially on, on usury uh, standards that can create cost and um, uh, in terms of, of delivering credit, a responsible credit. So I think uh, with the OCC charter, you would get a national set of rules to comply with, which could arguably foster innovation. And I didn't used to be comfortable with that, but I think now that we have a consumer bureau, that's probably a good thing. That said, uh, it would be a non-deposit taking uh, charter. So to the extent online lenders want a disabled deposit base uh, to deploy in their capacity, you wouldn't even, would not be able to get that. It, obviously, it also wouldn't uh, help uh, blockchain startups uh, because it doesn't, it only uh, would apply to traditional lending like lending and taking deposits and check processing. So, uh, but I just give that as an example where I think <clears throat> the OCC is proactively trying to foster innovation with the creation of a new charter specifically geared for that. Jordan, do you want to Speaking of the, the CFPB, <clears throat> I think an interesting power that they have been granted is that to, uh, regulate what happens with your financial data. Uh, we don't have much of a standard about financial data. Uh, a bank or whatever firm uh, own, has your data doesn't have to share that data with you. They don't have to disclose it to you. Uh, we believe strongly that one of the areas where regulation can help consumers going forward is to make sure that you own your own financial data in the same way that you should own your own healthcare records and be able to therefore change doctors. Uh, if, uh, if advice and if technology are looking at all of your financial information and transactions to help optimize things for you, it's very important that you be able to own that data so you can take it elsewhere, so you can compare across providers. And this is uh, an area where if we're not careful, uh, we'll, we'll drift into too much uh, control of, of that information and not enough choice for consumers. And I think this is an area we've been working with the White House and with uh, congressmen and women on both sides of the aisle to make sure that this is front and center. Let's focus on that, because I, I wanted to turn next to where, the inno where we had a lot more innovation still to come, where we, where we were kind of in the second inning. And one area is the whole question, I think, of big data and what you do with it, and machine learning and AI capacity and how you can kind of put these two together and, and really do a lot of stuff. So there, where do you think we are now relative to what do you expect over the next few years? Uh, and I'm gonna ask each of you that separately because I think that is something where all of us have a sort of sense that we're right at the very beginning. And <laughs> what are gonna be the big questions that come from that? So why don't we start with you, John? It's very much the early days, I absolutely agree. And this is a big area, it's something that uh, we're going to see so many interesting innovations coming out over the next release. And it started really with things like, uh, you know, I go back maybe a decade to Mint.com, which started to show you your transactions across all your accounts, you know, a very popular aggregator. 
But now companies are taking that information, and at Betterment, for instance, we're telling <coughs> you which accounts you should open and how much you should save in each account and automating that for you to make sure that you stay on track to a retirement goal or to a, 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 you know, a kid's college goal or whatever the case may be. We're able to tell you how much is in your bank account and automatically sweep that over to a different account. People are using your, your flows, the, the bills that are coming due, the amount of your paycheck to help optimize everything about your financial life, which is ultimately what I as a consumer want. I want this managed. I want to not have to worry about it because I trust that the technology is better at it than me. Uh, I, of course, have agency in it, but we, we imagine in the future sort of like um, uh, you know, someday uh, self-driving cars will take us places more efficiently, uh, more safer uh, and faster than we could drive ourselves. More and more uh, technology applied to our financial data will help us get to our goals in life faster, more efficiently, safer. Jeff, how do you see it? And how much are you using, you know, how much are you collecting of your customers' data? How much are you... Are you you know, predicting what they're doing. How, how far down this road have you gone? I mean, we're, we're probably as advanced as any of the big banks in the industry right now, and I would say it's very, very early. Um, we use data in very similar ways uh, that John described. Um, we look at propensity to, to transact. We look at what people should do, which, by the way, what you want to do and what you should do don't always equate, and that's part of our responsibility to sort of help, help clients uh, negotiate that. But... A lot of the stuff that we're talking about here is just making the existing processes more efficient. I mean, modern portfolio theory has been around for 30 years to optimize portfolios. And what all of us are doing right now is we're trying to make it better, faster, and more accessible. I think the more interesting conversation is what comes after that. And that's where I think the whole concept of AI really plays into, into place. So yes, we can talk about how to more efficiently balance or rebalance your 60-40 you know, asset allocation. But what about solving my mom's long-term health care issues, right? She's 80 years old, and why not leverage AI to help me figure out what the best uh, health care options are for her? Which, by the way, is an emotionally draining option. It's a financially challenging issue in terms of how much the, you need to put down. Um, there are a whole bunch of um, tax issues around that. Like, let's use technology, and let's, in our business model, let's give that technology to advisors to help move beyond just the investment choices of their lives, but help them navigate really complex issues. And AI is absolutely there now for organizations like Dart to Embrace. So how is Morgan Stanley going to help, let's take your mom as an example, uh, think through a long-term plan for her? Well, we have that, that answer to that problem exists. There is a person- Presumably on her financial assets allocation. Basis. No, 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 but, but try to find out, because I'm doing this right now, try to find out the best um, you know, nursing home options, long-term health care options on the North Fork and Long Island are. There's lots of them. And the, the economics of them are varied very differently. There's a person at Morgan Stanley today who can tell you exactly, they could sit down with you. The problem is that's not accessible. That individual can't talk to 2.2 million customers around that conversation. There's a finite number. But if you can instantiate that knowledge in an artificially intelligent-based solution, you're in a position to actually start to converse with customers in a way that our financial advisors simply can't do today. And I think that's really the, where the ball is going to go in terms of exposing that knowledge. And, and who will be doing that? I mean, the company, you know, Facebook and Google know more about us than virtually anybody. I mean, is it going to be those kind of companies? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be you know, disruptors like you? Sheila, where do you see going forward? The yeah, data is everywhere. I think that's, going that's, to be that's, that's that a really well. good question. Of course, banks have a lot of data, too. It is just you, you, you know, migrate to more of an open bank model where everybody's got access to everybody else's information potentially. Uh, uh, can, can actually do uh, tr initiate payments and do transactions out of that. It's not clear. I mean, I think banks to some extent have an advantage because they have a lot of data already, especially on, in terms of uh, financial transactions and proclivities. So um, I, I, I don't know how it's going to come out, but I think competition is great. And I also think this is a prime example of the, the tremendous consumer benefits because the type of service you're talking about heretofore would only be available to wealthy people because it's, if, if it's individualized, it's going to be expensive to provide. And by using... Uh, technology to uh, commoditize that and make it broadly available to millions at a very low cost. I think that's that's just a tremendous public benefit. Where do you see it, John? And which 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 areas have we got the biggest, you know, furthest to go? And which ones we're going to do first in terms of using aggregating more kinds of data? At Betterment, we say our mission is to empower people to do what's best for their money, so they can live better. We think ultimately 
this affects all of your financial decisions, uh, and, uh, and it, of course, goes beyond uh, just how you invest. It is, uh, we imagine, becoming your central financial relationship because we know where best to put your money. We know how much to set aside for whatever is going on this month. We know how much to set aside for long-term things like taking care of your parents or, or whatever the, the case may be. And uh, the better uh, these systems become, the more uh, indispensable that they, they come. The reason advice is important in all of this, the reason we talk about advice, is you want those kinds of important financial decisions, like the core financial decisions of your life, to be made in your best interest. You want an advisor you can trust. And the fiduciary rule is about somebody who has to act in your best interest. Our advantage is that we are a fiduciary advisor, and we believe this advice will become more central to your financial life than banks have been in the past. But you've both, you've all talked about financial advice, and we're still very much within the realms of kind of finance. What about, you know, presumably on a long-term basis, my, you know, my financial future would be, I'd get better advice if you knew you know, my health trajectory, if you knew, if you had some genetic data, if you knew my lifestyle more closely than perhaps you already, if you knew what I ate, if I, you know, all of that stuff. Is that coming in? I, I, think, I think, well, I think it, it will ultimately come in. I think to John's point, I agree with him, is that it's about client, it's customer control of that data. But there will be aggregators that will take your DNA, your favorite wines, where you shop, and what you, you know, what you buy your spouse for their birthday, right? And what they're gonna do is they're gonna optimize that in a way that's going to make suggestions to you, and it's going to be, you're gonna negotiate with these providers, and the more information you give, the more discounts you're gonna get, the better service you're gonna receive, and the less, it's, it's basically gonna be, and, and who solves that? I'm not really sure. That's really interesting, to get back to this collaborate. So who is gonna be collaborating with them? Is this gonna be you know, new, new groups that are putting this together? Is it you collaborating with, a, I don't know, a Facebook? Is it, you know, where is that gonna happen? John? Yeah, I, listen, there are uh, collaboration, collaborations like this happening already. We're partnering with multiple different providers, multiple uh, financial institutions to be able to provide a really seamless experience. I think the, uh, there's uh, uh, questions around uh, partnering with folks like Facebook or Google because of some of the uh, financial barriers, they, they don't necessarily want to get into the financial business because of the additional regulation it would bring to right. all of their businesses. Uh, but uh, over time, as people become more and more comfortable with the this, this types of services that we provide, I think we'll see integration with those. Yeah, and, and I think banks that embrace that and see it coming and, and potentially position themselves to be the aggregator. Uh, will do well than those that are kind of, ooh, you know. Um, but who is, who is positioning themselves? I, well? I don't want to mention names, but I think some are doing better than others. <laughs> <laughs> I want to open up to questions, I and mean, I've got lots more questions of you, but I'd really like to get a sense, particularly on this topic, of where others uh, think things are going. So if you have a, anyone have a question? Yes, gentleman right there, two thirds of the way back. So first off, thank you for being a customer. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I apologize for uh, having failed you and not um, explaining that you can call us. You can call us seven days a week. We have uh, the best rated customer service in the brokerage industry, according to Consumer Reports. We're the only company to receive that designation that has been in business less than 30 years. So people love our, our, our service. Please call us. We also have advisors on staff. Uh, we, do, we have CFPs, uh, PhDs in finance, who will talk to you about your goals. Uh, and you'll see increasingly the way that we are moving is not to be, we, we don't, we've never called ourselves a robo-advisor. It's an industry term. We've always talked about service. It's been a core part of our proposition from the beginning. And as we add more advisors, we are your advisor. We are your personalized financial manager. And if you have really sophisticated needs, we got that. We have specialists that we will refer you to to help you with estate planning or taxes or whatever that thing is. If it's a simple financial plan, we've got that. And if you're just starting out, automated tools can take care of all of it. So no matter how much advice you need, we've got you covered. Can I just um, yeah. answer that question too? 
and we'd love you to be a customer of Morgan Stanley. <laughs> but um, I could have said the same exact thing that he just said, right? And we're actually launching our quote unquote you know, individual advice model uh, for, that, for, that, uh, for that sector. But we've, we've looked at this whole issue of customer engagement, right? And the truth is, all of you are different. Some of you never want to talk to a human being, and some of you want to talk to a human every day. And it's about customer choice. And I will tell you, the single most powerful tool that we have in our weapon is when we actually physically pick up the phone and call the customers. So we can talk about all the robo stuff here and all this innovation, but much of our strategy is to try to create as much capacity so that our advisors do what they do best, which is actually talk to people. And that may change over time, but today, that's where we actually really drive customer satisfaction. So you're using the fintech to create the capacity for the do the old school stuff. Do the old school stuff. That's, that's absolutely right. That's a slightly different model. Any more questions on that topic, or indeed any others? Yes, gentlemen at the very back. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess going uh, tying this to the overall title of the of the theme today, right, which is disruption. I think the goal of disruption is to improve the lives of consumers. And you know, I, I guess the question that I would raise for this panel and perhaps throughout the course of the day is, you know, are we objectively making the lives of consumers better? Right. I mean, I know John, you will have a point of view of this, but you know, to the extent that uh, you know, half of the country or more is still living paycheck to paycheck is the fintech revolution, evolution, whatever you want to call it, uh, is that objectively making the lives of consumers better? You can answer that one. Jeff. Um, well, I certainly hope so. If, um, and if we're not, I actually don't think we're doing the right thing because I think when we're most successful as a country, when businesses like ours are actually thriving and the, and the individuals are, um, are being successful. I, listen, I think what, what's happening is and it's happening in, in Betterman, I think it's happening at Morgan Stanley as well, is that we are starting to democratize access to much more sophisticated financial instruments, solutions, products in a way that gives knowledge um, to, to the lower end of the spectrum. I mean, Morgan Stanley has 2.2 million customers, 1.4 million of them under 250,000, right? So we have a large customer base of actually quote unquote smaller, uh, quote unquote smaller, smaller customers. So, um, I, I believe so, and I think that in the end, so long as the customer is in control, and we give the customer more choice, uh, that we're all going to uh, we're all going to benefit from that. I want to ask, yeah, can I ask you about that too? Because I'm struck. What is the the stat of the the fraction of Americans that can't write a four hundred dollar check? It's it's forty forty percent. I may not have it exactly right, but it's some absolutely stunning figure, and obviously that has a huge number of reasons. But but one of them is in part kind of lack of financial resilience and lack of financial literacy. Is this going to be able to help that? Right. So I think it's, it's more of a uh, real wage growth, too, which of is course, uh, yes, of course, slowly one. improving. But um, yeah, I would just, I, I, I appreciate that question because I, I do think, you know, everybody wants to wrap themselves around fintech, we're innovative and all that. But I think some are just kind of cream skimming, right? So serving customers, just finding new ways to serve customers that can easily access credit through banks now. and. And doing it more, frankly, through a regulatory arbitrage, where you know they, they don't have the same regulatory costs, so they can do it marginally cheaper. And I, I, you know, I like competition, so I don't argue with that. But I think you do need to acknowledge that there are, that some of this is kind of wrapping itself in fintech, but really is just competing for customers that are already very well served by uh, by banks. And I think that the true test is whether we can expand uh, res access to responsible credit by a larger swath of the community, and you know, just on, on the very base level, for those people who don't even have four hundred dollars. Uh, the people have savings, then, then get them to a, a place where they can access more sophisticated financial advice as well. But I think credit availability at, at um, lower rates and expanded access is really uh, part of what hopefully is happening here. And, and I think some probably do better do than others. Do we have evidence of that yet? I mean, what will be the metrics that you're succeeding in that? Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I think uh, you know, online lending is growing uh, rapidly, some doing it better than others. And uh, there's, but uh, you, you can see with the uh, disruptions, uh, those that purely rely on marketplace funding, uh, it, it's, it's highly volatile. We saw that during the crisis. There's really nothing innovative about originating to distribute or, or uh, accessing market funding sources as opposed to deposits. So, and in a downturn, investors are not stable. Insured deposits stay, investors do not. So I do think hybrid models where you retain a good portion of your, of your uh, loans that, so you can have that, uh, that recurring income stream is, uh, is going to be more resilient than pure originate distribute. I think you're seeing a lot of online lenders migrate uh, to that uh, model. 
now. Uh, but I do think we need to, to, to learn from the past and not just everything that's called FinTech or innovative is necessarily new and to the extent it's really just a regulatory arbitrage. I think you just need to understand what it but is. But I was just gonna add one other thing on that that I think, um, you know, I spent some time in Bangladesh a couple years ago and you have you know, women walking 10 miles a day to pay back 47 cents on their microcredit. I mean, there's a play here that has, maybe it's blockchain, uh, maybe it's a different type of banking structure that could potentially really empower the lives of those people. Yeah. And, and I think FinTech absolutely has, because those people actually do have cell phones. Right, yeah. I well, think we have a, a financial services construct that's really rooted in the past. And by that I mean we think about financial services as something that everybody should have to do and take on themselves and manage themselves. This is an outdated way of thinking about it. It is as though uh, we're in the early 1800s with medicine, where uh, you know if you broke a leg, you'd set it at home yourself. <laughs> um, if you needed a dentist, you'd get your cousin to pull your tooth. Um, this is the way that we deal with financial services today. And everyone shouldn't have to do that. It, it, you, should, you should have advice about, about these important things in your life. It should be managed for you, because these are not things that we're well evolved or equipped to handle. We all are busy. We all have day jobs. That, and, Dealing with financial services is increasingly complex, and there's all this technology on the other side of it. Big banks, hedge funds um, are, are coming in with amazing equipment that is all geared at taking advantage of everybody else in the market. It is a losing proposition for retail investors today on their own. And we have to change our construct. People need advice, they need management, and, uh, and it should be accessible to everyone in the same way that healthcare should ultimately be accessible now, to all. Right, but you just talk, we're, we're, we're talking about very different segments of the population, though I think people are gonna be using Betterment or not the people that, that can't write a $400 check, I think, or certainly not the, the woman in India who may not have a cell phone, because so few women have cell phones in India. Uh, who needs to transfer 47 cents. But so I just think it's a, a different problem. Uh, yeah, it's a but different even problem. Even for them, they'll get management, right? Even for that person. It, th think about how hard it is, if, you're, if you can't write a $400 check, to see around the corner, to see to a day where you can and where you can save for retirement. It is, it is, it is awful. I, and to get back to the, to, to the original question, it's terrible that 50% of, of the country uh, just has no savings. And another 25% doesn't really have enough savings to amount to anything you know, significant for retirement. Only 11% of retirement spending comes from personal savings. Right? People are not saving for retirement. Uh, they're not saving enough to, to, to get there. So it's not just about retirement, but it's about advice for all of your financial needs and, 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 I, and I agree, there, there's a lot more to do. But in each of the, I mean, these segments are very different, but in each of them, collaboration between, well, you, the use of technology, whether it's incumbents or whether it's in collaboration with new startups, can be really transformational, whether it's the, the woman in Bangladesh or indeed the 50% of Americans who, who can't write a $400 check. There's a question for you, John, and I don't have my glasses on, so you can probably see it better than me, but I think it says, do you advocate for exclusive rights preventing industry from reselling customer data? So uh, do I advocate for not selling customer data? Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and, and you should be in control of your data. Would you want your doctor selling your healthcare data? Of course not. Uh, that shouldn't be allowed. Uh, so there should be protection about your data. You should be in control of it. You should decide who gets it. But it should also be portable. You should be able to download it. You should be able to take it to somebody else, see whatever uh, uh, anyone collects on you. Uh, and own that data. Uh, and, and all of that can be done today securely. We often hear about how do you do this. Uh, we already have things like two-factor authentication and one-time passwords that you use just for and read-only access and all these kinds of things that make this a really easy problem to solve. It's just a matter of getting all the financial institutions to agree upon doing it. But it also leads to the, to the second question that somebody um, posed on an app, which is to all of you. Uh, how can I trust that firms are using my data anonymously? There is a trust question here. There's a security question, which we'll get to, but there's a trust question. How can we all trust when there is, particularly, uh, Jeff, you, you described a world in which there are aggregators of all kinds of data um, to help, you know, to help us, but at the same time, how do we trust them? Well, the first firm that violates that trust is going to be, I mean, our incentives here, I think, are completely aligned. And I'm not saying that there's not going to be bad actors in this, in this process, but we just can't afford that. As an organization, uh, we, we can't afford it. And I do think this is where 
I think the regulators are going to play more and more in terms of building a framework <laughs> around how information, what do you actually own, how do you port it to other places. Uh, this is a really, this is an area that's sort of outpacing where the, where the regulators are right now, and I think there's, there's more work to be done here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think uh, this has potential uh, great benefits for consumers, but the broader, if you make this information portable, there's a broader group of, of for-profit entities that are going to be wanting to use it. And uh, banks, you can say what you want about banks, but there's a fairly uh, uh, extensive regulatory framework. You have examiners in those banks. You know, you have people kind of watching out for the consumer. You won't necessarily have that with this much broader array of potential users. It's very specific. Do you think you won't, or that over time you will develop a, a greater regulation? Well, you'll, you'll, you'll never be able to have anything as intensive as, as bank regulation for, for the broader, uh, all the different potential users and in industry of this financial data. So I think, I agree with you, I think regulators are behind it. They need to get ahead of it, you know, maybe uh, liability provisions, uh, you know, uh, very stiff fines, whatever. Uh, but somehow I think you need to understand that the more, the broader access to this data, the more uh, risk of abuse, potential, uh, you know, illicit use, um, uh, fraud. I mean, in Europe, they're moving towards this, not sharing the data, but actually being able to go in and access, uh, initiate payments and access a, a customer's uh, bank account. So those all may be very good things, probably are, but I do think the regulators need to stay ahead of it because right now you have very firm rules about what banks can and cannot do with data. The banks are obligations when there's an unauthorized uh, charge uh, and uh, it's not so clear with uh, all these third parties that are gonna be getting into this space. Are there any more questions? Oh gosh, lots, brilliant. Gentleman here at the front. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, given the, uh, the current land of the current president, I don't think it changes anything. Uh, I think President Obama is very happy with Richard Cordray. Um, I, I think it's probably an increasingly safe assumption that Hillary Clinton's going to be president. And so my guess is, is that he will have, uh, continue to have strong support at the White House. Longer term, uh, it probably needs to be fixed legislatively. I, always, I, I was a very strong supporter of the CFPB, but I did think it should have a commission for a lot of reasons, including that one. So assuming at some point the, the Congress will get around to fixing that. But again, given who the current and likely future president is going to be, I don't think the fact that Rich is now going to be reporting them really is going to have any, any significant impact at all. Lady to the second table. Yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And how, how uh, they will perform uh, through the cycle is, is really not clear. And I think having some balance sheet capacity makes you more resilient, which is why I think a hybrid model. I think uh, prudent uh, partnerships with banks that will have more stable sources of uh, financing can be part of the solution. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so I, I think there are steps you can make in terms of how they construct the business model will make them more resilient. But anybody that relies uh, uh, predominantly on marketplace funding is going to have trouble in a downturn. It just, we, you know, how many times do we need to learn that? It dries up. So I think over time we will, we will learn. Uh, I think probably uh, when you get into a cycle, it's, it's going to help the banks competitively and those that have good partnerships, prudent partnerships with banks will be... Uh, uh, more likely to survive as well as their own balance sheet. I want to go to another question from the app, which is um, focusing, uh, reminding us of the theme of this uh, panel. It's about collaboration. This, how and where is the collaboration happening? Which of Facebook or Google and perhaps Amazon is the most aggressive into moving into financial services within the foreseeable future and why? John, put your, put your um, <laughs> you know, glasses looking on into the future. Which of them? So 
everyone on this list, Facebook, Google, Amazon, is moving into financial services in some way. We've seen Facebook uh, doing payments. Google, of course, has Wallet and is pretty big in payments and is doing more and more there. Amazon went into lending a bit uh, and, uh, and had a partnership uh, with Wells, I believe, uh, for at least for a little bit. Um, and, uh, and look, they want to do, they are doing lots of lending to small businesses uh, and, uh, and will continue to, to, to do more and more of that. Uh, but it's, uh, I think right now it's all on the, on the, the margins. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're not going to become financial services companies at their core. Uh, because it would distract from their core mission and, 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 and their business. I mean, Do you agree with that, Jeff? Uh, I think they're afraid of the regulatory framework. They don't want to get caught up in the stuff that we, you know, that we deal with, uh, I think, to a large extent. I do think that there's, uh, there's opportunities to partner in certain ways, and we actually partner with many of these, uh, these organizations. In, in what ways? Well, they, I mean, Google's got some great technology, um, and uh, bringing that technology to bear um, through machine learning algorithms and things like that. So, you know, certainly as a provider, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of wait and see attitude going on here in terms of who really has the, the you know, do we need more than, do, you know, do we need them more than they need us or vice versa? And I think there's a little bit of that going on um, combined with the fact that, you know, the regulatory framework is a little bit of wait and see. Um, it will happen, I think it will happen probably slower than people think it should or will, but I think it will happen. And who will need who more? That's actually a really good way of putting it. <laughs> well, listen, I, you I actually, I will, I will say the following. I believe that the, the technology is largely being commoditized, that there are many, many players that you can get solutions in the marketplace, whether it be mobile solutions, machine learning solutions, AI. And I believe that competitive advantage is going to be driven by intellectual capital, and, and, and a differentiated knowledge set. But what about in data? Because they have well, a lot of data. Yeah, well, we have a lot of data, too, um, about our customers. Uh, on a head-to-head? -head, uh, it depends what type of data you're talking about. They don't have the kind of data we have. They don't have the, the degree of personalization that we have. Um, you know, we don't have 15 years of every single trade that every customer's ever done in our, in our warehouse and every phone call that's ever made and every email that's been done. That's a we very, have very rich... 15 years of every single interaction they've had with their friend every day. Okay, well, they, they, data it, it's, it's, they have value. Trust me, they have value, right? And, and if we can cut the right deal, maybe there's, uh, there's an opportunity there. And by the way, they, they, there's an interesting content set there for us and, and vice versa. So we'll see. I think it's interesting that so few companies have broken through in financial services to become major national brands like these firms. Amazon did it in shopping, right? Um, uh, Netflix did it in entertainment. What's the financial services equivalent of that? It is yet to be written. And, uh, and obviously, we think we're well positioned to be that company, or I wouldn't be you know, do, doing what I'm doing. Uh, but, uh, but there should be really tech-driven, consumer-focused companies that break through in financial services in the next decade. That is a terrific place to end on. Um, but we have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask one more question, I think, because I have so many hands. Is there somebody else who wants to ask a quick last question? Yes, that way. Don't, that's right, gentlemen, halfway back. Hi. As, uh, as asset owners, whether they are next-gen wealth or women or millennials, are increasingly putting pressure on their asset managers to find investments that align with their values, who do you think is going to be better positioned to serve those customers, uh, humans or technology? That's a great question. Okay, John. It's always the best of both, uh, and, uh, and to understand your values sometimes requires listening and sometimes requires you telling a story. Values are, it's, they're hard to code, <laughs> right? Uh, and so uh, if that is, is then translated into the following, uh, you know, coded investment by somebody who's well familiar with, with both, uh, it's, it'll be a marriage of the best technology and, 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 the, best, uh, and the best advisors.